And it's my pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Dr. Michael Lipson. Dr. Lipson is recently retired from his position as an optometrist and associate professor at the University of Michigan. His clinical practice involves specialty contact lenses, ortho-K, keratoconus, post-transplant, post-refractive surgery, and severe dry eye. Dr. Dr. Lipson is the author of the book, Contemporary Orthokeratology, which I have an autographed copy of. <laughs> and he is a consultant to the specialty lens industry embracing orthokeratology education. So Dr. Lipson was the obvious choice for this presentation. He is a, a true industry expert in orthokeratology. And I've known Dr. Lipson for many years because we served on the Sclera Lens Society together. And Dr. Lipson, you've just been a dear friend to me and just a, a wonderful educator and person. And I'm really excited for your presentation today. Well, thanks for the opportunity to present today, Stephanie. Uh, Mark, uh, thank you for uh, introducing the topic of myopia management so thoroughly and uh, probably stealing all of my material in the process, but I am gonna be referencing a lot of what Dr. Bullimore said. Um, I guess at this point, I get to move from the, uh, all of the science and the research area into more of a practical focus on ortho K is a tool to manage myopia in your practice. Uh, this is my uh, disclosure and uh, we'll move on. And basically this is just a, a quick mention of what I plan to cover today in the next uh, 50 minutes or so. Uh, is there a difference between ortho K and uh, ortho K for myopia management? Um, what do we know about ortho K and what do we not know about it? Um, what does it do to the eye? What does it do for the patient? And uh, just a little bit in how OrthoK fits into the overall myopia management picture and why I believe that OrthoK is an ideal mode of practice for myopia management. So starting off, uh, OrthoK versus myopia management. Now, traditionally for years, we've prescribed OrthoK as a refractive correction an alternative to glasses and contact lenses or refractive surgery. But when we've done that, our goal really has been to provide clear vision, good distance vision. And it was kind of a, a lucky accident that we found that while our patients, our children were wearing ortho K to correct their myopia, it slowed their progressive rate of progression in myopia. So I like to call this a lucky side effect. Now, what we have found over time is that people respond differently to this. That again, some people still progress during ortho K, some people completely stop. And that's where these mean numbers come into all the uh, studies. But we also find that if we use ortho K, the same design is not necessarily the same in each patient. So we have to kind of customize this. And so we have found through some research that there are design modifications that can be made to enhance the myopia management effect with ortho K. And we'll go into that a little more, a little later. But the same way that we don't really prescribe the same spectacle lens for every patient, we certainly should not, when we're considering myopia management, prescribe the same ortho K design for each patient. Um, individual differences to the response on the topography and the uh, subjective response exist for a variety of designs and different patients. It may be dependent on the baseline Ks, their refraction, pupil size, anterior chamber death. So um, the slide, the picture there is to demonstrate that it, this is not a cookie cutter thing. It has to be custom designed for the individual patient. And here's kind of an example of the same design used on two different patients, and these are pre and post topography maps showing in the left, you see a very, very well-centered, but very small treatment zone, the blue in the very center. And the topography, the pre and post topography shown on the right shows a much larger central optical zone or treatment zone created on the cornea by the exact same design on two different patients. So again, we have to change the design and individualize it for each patient. 
Now, as Dr. Bullimore had mentioned, a lot of what we know about myopia and managing progression of myopia was originally published as an IMA, IMI white papers in 2019. And uh, one of the things that it was updated just recently, published in 2021 this year, that over a thousand articles on myopia have been published in the last year and a half to two years. And that there's a lot of advances in the definition of what is myopia, what is pre-myopia, and how we have to monitor myopic progression. And again, it also uh, reiterates the fact that there are individual differences in myopia progression, many factors involved in this. Um, age of onset, uh, the heredity, parental myopia, how much near work, how much time outdoors, all those things make each patient react differently to their myopia and myopia progression. Also, the CLEAR reports were recently published, and uh, a lot of people who I'm familiar with uh, were authors on this, and the CLEAR studies with CLEAR stood for the Contact Lens Evidence-Based Academic Reports. And one of the things that I'd like to highlight through their results was that the optical mechanism underlying the myopia control effect of ortho -K is still not totally defined. Certainly, there is strong evidence, as Mark had mentioned earlier, to the peripheral refractive changes, but also higher order aberrations are a factor and the accommodative response. But that all of these things seem to focus on the choroid, that it's uh, transferred from the choroid to the sclera, to the signal to slow myopia progression. And, um, and again, the other thing that's emphasized here is even though efficacy of ortho -K has been well established over many, many years through a lot of studies, um, it's still warranted to find out what the fundamental mechanisms in play are. So what we know about ortho -K and myopia management is that the multiple studies show that ortho -K is very effective in slowing refractive increases and slowing axial length increases. Now, uh, in respect to uh, what Dr. Bullimore has just presented, I'm gonna talk about this, but the studies have shown percentages in ortho -K of uh, about 50% control versus, versus controls uh, in refractive changes and, and quite a varying studies between 38 and 62% in axial length changes. The effect is most likely from peripheral myopic defocus. There may be some effect from accommodation, the, the change in lag of accommodation or the accommodative effort required to focus up close. The one thing we also know about ortho -K, and for those of you who have not done it, you may be fearing wearing a lens overnight is a high risk but ortho -K does have the potential for complications. But in reality, studies have shown and in clinics, most doctors have not experienced major complications. There are very few complications and it is less than other modalities of wear. Uh, the complications have been shown to be able to be minimized if you can really ensure that the patient is compliant with the lens care you prescribe and compliant with the follow-up care that they're getting from you to assure that everything is progressing well. So keeping the lens clean, caring for it properly, wearing it the way it's prescribed, all critical to minimizing the rates of complications, which to begin with are low. Relative to safety, uh, Dr. Bullimore uh, was the uh, principal of a retrospective study on ortho -K, finding um, about 7.7 incidents of risk of MK for every 10,000 years of wear. So one in every 1,300 patient years of wear, and that's much less than overnight wear for silicone hydrogel wearers. And again, the potential problems that could come up with ortho -K, um, with good fitting, good follow-up, and compliance from the patient. So really to summarize what we know about ortho -K is that it does correct myopia, provides good visual acuity, it is reversible, it's temporary. Uh, patients report better vision-related quality of life. It is an attractive 
option to uh, an alternative basically to glasses or daytime contacts. It does slow myopia progression and we're gonna detail each of these areas a little more. So really when you start ortho, okay, what does it do to the patient's eye? Well, it, if anybody who's studied this, you know about the changes that it thins the epithelium centrally. The average central epithelial thickness is between about 50 and 55 microns, and it thins it somewhere between 10 and 20 microns, depending on the prescription, how much ortho K effect you're looking for. It also shows a thickening of epithelium under the reverse curve. So basically these are um, OCT maps of just epithelial thickness, not the topography, not the curvature, but the thickness of the epithelium on the far left. And it shows where that has reduced in the blue. And uh, again, these are on the lower right, these are epithelial maps before and after ortho K. And uh, again, on the far right, you can see where the epithelium is significantly thinner and where it thickens in the area under the reverse curve. So in addition to changing the central corneal epithelial thickness, the big changes that we see with our topographer is the changes in the topography that are characteristic that we've become familiar with. And we do find these characteristic patterns where you want to see the blue in the very center showing the area of consistent central flattening to provide good central visual acuity. And what we call the classic red ring, which is the steepening area around that. And what we also find, for example, in this particular case is that the changes that you see in the topography map and the actual curvature changes are not one-to-one -one for the refraction, meaning in this particular case, we don't necessarily see for a five diopter myo, five diopters have changed centrally. It went from a 4208 to a 3826. So a little less than four diopters of change created over five diopters of refractive improvement. So again, this is a, an optical phenomenon uh, associated with Mutterland's formula that I won't spend a lot of time on today. So anyways, you should know when we do ortho K, we can look at topographical changes in a number of different ways with axial maps and tangential maps. The axial maps are good at defining how much refractive improvement and refractive changes you've made through the ortho K procedure. The Tangential maps are ideal for locating the positioning of the lens on the eye overnight if it's well centered. And uh, again, you can learn to use these maps and it's very, very important to be able to use them in your follow-up and your ortho K patients. Well, in addition, I've talked about now the epithelial changes and the topographic changes. What else does it do to the eye? It reduces myopia, obviously. Uh, it also, while it's doing that, it increases spherical aberrations and other higher order aberrations. And again, that is another area that is being investigated in terms of its contribution to the slowing of axial elongation. Um, certainly visual acuity unaided is far better. Uh, one study showed 92% uh, of ortho K patients uh, that's a study that I did, 2025 or better, 90% subjectively reported equal or better vision than with their soft lenses. In addition to the refractive changes, as we mentioned before, ortho K creates relative myopic, uh, peripheral myopic defocus. So centrally, it corrects the vision very, very well. So the patient is seeing very well in the distance, can function all day with no correction. But peripherally, it creates a image shell that peripheral to the macula focuses in front of the retina. And that is thought to be a very strong signal to slowing the progression of the myopia. So now we've gone from what does it do to the eye now? How does the patient perceive this? What 
does the patient get out of all of this? Well, number one, this is a, a pet subject for me, is the improved vision-related quality of life. The fact that they don't have to wear any correction during the course of the day is huge. No waking hours correction. Um, some of the things that are a little uh, more intangible that happen with them, basically it, it's been measured that they have a better self-image, they have less activity restrictions, their eyes are more comfortable during the day that they don't have to wear correction for glasses or contact lenses. They're not as worried about their eyes, about losing their correction or damaging or getting injured while they have their glasses on. And overall, they report higher overall satisfaction with their total vision correction. And uh, this was proven out in a study that uh, we did one of them uh, published in 2005 on Ortho K um, where 90% report equal or better vision than those who were wearing soft lenses. And this was in a crossover study. So people got to wear both the uh, Ortho K and the soft lenses and compare that Objectively, 92% um, had 2025 or better, 83% had 2020 or better. So this is a little bit of the study, and this is the question we came to ask when we did this study many years ago. If you, if you gave your patients the opportunity to wear a soft lens for two months and then to experience ortho -K for two months, which would they choose to prefer? Which would they want to stay with? And what do you think the percentages would be? Now, Again, this would, uh, is a crossover study, meaning it was randomized. So some started with the soft lenses and some started with ortho -K. We had a total of 65 patients who wore each mode for two months. And this was in um, 18 and older. And those who were in the study, about 70% of them had previously worn soft lenses. A small percentage were in Jeep gas permeables, but uh, but 25% had not worn contacts previous. So it was kind of an interesting balance of patients in this. And you can see the mean uh, refractive error was you know, moderate myopic. The results of the study was that 68% of the patients at the end of the study chose to stay with ortho -K. Now, if you took, we analyzed the results for the patients who were just three or under the lower myopes, of those, 87% chose to stay with ortho K. So the lesson here and the message that I really wanted to get home and, and really brought home great is that given the opportunity to wear ortho K, patients love it. And they really enjoy not having to wear correction during the day. And so other results that I can report to you for that study is that um, there were no adverse events in either phase of the study, soft or the ortho K and that the actual scores were done on a, uh, a questionnaire. And uh, the major reasons that people wanted to stay with ortho -K, these were the statistically significant attributes were less activity restrictions, less dependent on their correction, and less overall eye symptoms. And the mean overall vision-related quality of life score for soft lenses was 74.4 and 80.5 for the ortho K. So 8% higher on this for ortho K. And again, overall 68% of those uh, who were in the study stayed with um, ortho K at the end of the study. So again, just to report one other thing, those above minus three, it was still 50-50. So it was a very, very, uh, a good response to ortho K. So again, I'd like to just spend a moment on what quality of life with ortho K, why, how do we measure this and why do we measure it? Because it impacts the patient. It's really what it's all about, making their vision less of a hassle for them. And the things, not only do we create good vision with ortho K, but people feel better about how they look they, they're not as worried. They feel more confident in themselves. They have a better just overall self-image if they don't have to depend on a correction. And they are willing to try more activities. So it's a, it's a great feeling that patients get, and they really love doing this. Now, 
just with the previous study that I was discussing, that was done with a, a questionnaire that was done for refractive, various refractive corrections, but it was not validated for overnight wear, for ortho okay. So over the years, I felt a little bit was missing from the field and I worked with a psychometrics expert. I was the clinical portion of this and we developed an ortho K and quality of life survey that was validated for ortho K as well as for other modes of correction. So all modes of contact lens correction, including ortho K, sclerals, gas permeables, soft lenses, whatever. It, it basically was tested and validated and uh, it included ortho K. And then there were 23 items. And the nice thing about this, this type of a survey can be used for different groups of wearers like we did. So you take a group of soft lens wearers and say, take the survey, get a score. A group of ortho K wearers, you can compare scores between the two groups, but you can do a pre and post with the same patient, meaning you have a patient wearing soft lenses or wearing glasses, take the survey and then fit them into ortho K or another mode and be able to compare that score for that individual patient. And uh, so that has been validated and it is available for use now. It is being used, hasn't been published a, a study with that as of yet. But we did many vision related quality of life evaluations, but we're not the only ones to do it. And this is a list of a number of other quality of life studies that have been done. But the, the important thing that we're really focusing on today is what does this do for the patient? It slows progression of myopia, it slows axial increases, axial elongation. So there is less progression in refraction compared to spectacles, and there's less axial length elongation compared to spectacles. And there are a number of studies that are done on this now. So again, what does this do for the patient? This is kind of rephrasing what Dr. Bullimore talked about uh, in the previous presentation. Less myopia progression means that there will be less ultimate degree of myopia. They will have a reduced risk of myopia-related pathology later in life. They will be better corrected, both unaided and aided. And again, I think even though he mentioned this, I'm going to repeat this because it's significant that um, you reduce the risk of myopic maculopathy by 67% for every diopter of increase that you slow down. So basically for 40% less risk for every diopter of less myopia. So if the patient is left to progress, they're wearing glasses for every diopter of increase while they're wearing their glasses, they've increased their risk of myopic maculopathy by 67% per diopter. So again, even a one diopter of reduction in myopia using ortho K is very significant for that patient long-term. Now, in addition to ortho K, you know there are other myopia management strategies. And uh, there was one paper that actually analyzed 16 different <laughs> strategies that are used clinical strategies such as spectacles, contacts, pharmaceuticals, and ortho K basically came out number three in efficacy in this, only preceded by atropine 0.5% and atropine 1%. Um, there was another recent meta-analysis done that ortho K controls myopia progression by about 45%. So there's a number of studies on this. So again, just to focus on this, how does it slow that myopia, myopia progression and the axial increases? It's because of the peripheral myopic defocus. Now, there may be other mechanisms in play that we don't know about, but those are still being studied right now. The effects of lag of accommodation and what I mentioned before, the effect of higher order aberrations. It's kind of interesting. This, this topography shows a very well-centered treatment zone here that creates this, but there was one study that I was involved with that 
relative to higher order aberrations that showed that lenses that were slightly decentered may have actually slowed progression even greater than a well-centered lens. So again, that has to do with the creation of those aberrations and that is further being studied. So again, but the important thing to know it's peripheral, it's not due to what you're doing centrally to correct the vision, it's the peripheral changes that are affecting this. The first randomly controlled trial on this was done um, by Pauline Cho and Hong Kong basically showed about a 43% less change in axial length compared to spectacles. Uh, the age on those um, was around nine years old. But this was one of the first studies that really focused on fast progression and analyzing progression by age and definitely showed faster myopia progression in younger aged kids. Just a, a quick note about what Dr. Bulmar mentioned relative to randomly controlled trials. They have their advantages because everything is very well controlled in those studies. They have a control group. Uh, they have a very defined population. Now, in reality, in your practice, you're dealing with patients that may not fit into what those studies have studied. Essentially, they define refractive error. The patients may generally be between one and minus four. They would have a limited amount of astigmatism, be a specific age, and have a uh, a certain maximum amount of aniso between the right and left eye. So if you have a patient sitting in your chair who is uh, ready to go into myopia management and you're talking about that with them, if they are not in that category of the defined study, they are not going to behave necessarily like the study outcomes reflect. So there may be individual differences for that patient. And uh, just something to keep in mind that reality in clinic is a little bit different than sometimes what you see in the studies. Now, this is the new thinking in terms of how to quantify myopia control. And this was, uh, like I said, helped pioneered by uh, Dr. Bullimore and Dr. Brennan. And it talks about the absolute reduction in axial elongation. Um, it varies with the treatment duration and it should be done in axial length. It is far more accurate. And I think the small quantities of change that we're talking about in tenths of millimeters is important to be able to keep in mind that we should be measuring axial length. Um, no matter how we define the refraction, again, it's not as precise, whether you do this via subjective refraction, whether you're doing this on a subjective cycloplegic refraction. A lot of the studies are doing uh, auto refraction or even a, a cycloplegic auto refraction. So again, you wanna know how much actual axial length you are limiting. So again, the percentages that you read about uh, vary with the age the length of treatment, the ethnicity, and the degree of uh, myopia, and when they start, everything. It's just a lot of variables. So axial length is more accurate. I encourage you to measure axial length if you are practicing myopia management. And it really, when you do this, it's a better overall representation of what you are doing, the tr treatment effect you are providing for that patient. So again, relative to myopia progression, we know that myopia progresses faster in younger patients. And that is a really important factor why ortho-K becomes more important. The sooner you start a myopia management strategy, the greater the potential you have to really be impactful in making these differences that are gonna impact that patient long-term. And uh, the ortho-K, I believe, is something you can start a lot earlier than you can with, say, soft lenses, for example. Uh, atropine, you can start even younger, but again, the important part in ortho-K, you can start young and it can be combined with other types of treatments like atropine. So if you can really lower the amount of myopia, how does it benefit your patient? What's the impact to them, their quality of life? Well. Certainly, they're less disabled when they are without their correction. Number two, they have better 
options and better outcomes if they do choose later in life to have refractive surgery. And uh, they do have a reduced risk of visual impairment later in life associated with longer axial length. So it is important doing myopia management at a young age. Now, certainly there's a number of things we don't know about ortho -K and uh, managing myopia, but as you can see from the graph, some of these studies get results that are all over the place. And that's really because there's individual differences in patient response. You have to customize therapy and your treatment and management for each individual patient and monitor that progress that you are hoping to get. So we have all seen this. If you practiced ortho-K for a long time, there are some patients you put into ortho-K, they show zero progression over time. You use the same lenses, eight, 10 years, same prescription. Um, some patients still progress even through our best efforts. And that's where some of the newer designs may come into effect in customizing various uh, parameters of the lens, such as optical zone, overall diameter of the lens, what they, we call the compression factor, how much your Jessen factor may be. Um, all of these things contribute to how the patient responds to this. One of the things that we really don't know is that what is the ideal peripheral refractive profile that creates the ideal myopia management effect? In other words, is it nasal or temporal? Is it you know, superior, inferior? Is it two diopters of defocus 10 degrees out? Is it three diopters 20 degrees out? We don't know what those numbers are. And that is an area that I would encourage a lot of research in, and it's very, very difficult to do that because it's a long study to do. But what ideally I think we should get to is trying to create an individual ideal ortho -K design for each individual patient to provide the best myopia management effect. And really to do that, we're gonna to have to evaluate peripheral refraction and maybe even peripheral retinal topography to create all of this. But again, that's down the road a little bit. Getting to more of some of the practical parts of working with ortho, okay, why don't you just start a patient? Why don't you just stop? Well, I think starting ortho, okay, can be done very early. Certainly, if you see someone, a patient who is progressing in their myopia, that's a, a great time to start. You're seeing that their axial length is increasing. Great time to start that. Um, patients who are motivated to get away from glasses or not wear glasses, uh, they still have to function. So it's a way for them to function all day with no correction. But uh, parents or kids motivated to slow that progression are again, ideal candidates can start any age really. Uh, ideally, I would say a majority of kids at age eight can do very, very well. Um, you can have uh, no real restriction on ages, but I think practically under age six is very difficult. Uh, but uh, eight years old, most kids can handle it. And it's at a, that's at a time when they are really starting to progress rather rapidly. But you should assure if you're gonna start a patient that they are going to be compliant with the care and the wearing of lenses as you prescribe it. Talk about when to stop. Now, really, if their only interest is just myopia management, I think you know they should probably be stopped somewhere in their early 20s, 21 or 22. But literally, there is no reason a patient ever has to stop wearing worth okay they could continue to wear lenses uh, to correct their vision as an alternative to glasses or contact lenses basically throughout their adult years. Uh, but another reason to stop would be really if they can not maintain regular wear or they just for some reason choose to wear soft lenses or glasses or pursue refractive surgery. But again, the important thing when patients ask me that question, when should I stop wearing these? I say there's no reason you ever have to stop and you can continue to wear them most of your life. 
patients who are candidates for ortho -K, uh, we have both the VST and the CRT uh, FDA indications uh, for refraction, for astigmatism. You can see that on the screen. Again, a note on this, higher prescriptions can be prescribed as an off-label prescription for that. And I just always emphasize off-label is okay to do. You're taking responsibility for that. You're making a doctoring decision to make that happen. And you can do that. I would also encourage for all patients that you have a, uh, an informed consent or a fitting agreement that you work with. More important than the actual numbers in ortho okay, to determine candidacy, you've got to have somebody who's motivated. That's the number one thing, motivation. Someone who is a progressing myope and is concerned about that. The parents who are concerned because they're both minus eight, minus nine, you see their kid coming in at minus 150, that's an ideal patient. The, the kids who are motivated to not wear correction, uh, great candidates for that. Again, there's no age restrictions, but I would say, look at the patient as an individual and say, is this patient ready for this? Can they handle the maintenance of lenses? And again, anybody who talks about expressing any interest in slowing axial elongation, slowing myopia, they're a great candidate for ortho -K. Real briefly, I just wanted to talk about uh, your pre-fitting exam, uh, the goals of treatment for vision correction and for slowing the pro progression. Um, have an informed consent, but establish the patient expectations. Make sure their questions are answered, that anything that they expect, they may have heard from somebody else, that you establish what those expectations are in reality. Uh, but establish what your expectations for the patient are, um, that you give them a fitting agreement. It can be orally given to them by you. It should be maybe even reinforced with a video and a handwritten or a, um, a written form that you have. The, these forms would have everything on there, including what their follow-up schedule is expected to be, so they know what to expect. A, uh, a little section on what to do if, if they lose a lens, if their eye gets red, if their lens decenters, all those issues should be dealt with in this fitting agreement. And the assure them that this is a very successful and safe process and that compliance is critical. Uh, you should know if you're just getting into ortho, okay, there's different ways to fit the lenses. Um, you can use a strictly empirical formula based on their uh, prescription, K readings, HVID. Uh, there's systems that use diagnostic lenses. There's very, very sophisticated topography-based software to virtually design that lens or virtually create a diagnostic fitting. And then there's another system that actually puts a lens on overnight to evaluate what their first night of wear would be. And these examples down below basically show a lens that is decentered in one way or another where the treatment zone is not perfectly centered after that first night. And the uh, pictures on the far right basically uh, demonstrate what the topography-based software shows you is a simulated uh, uh, fluorescein pattern under the lens. If you're going to manage ortho -K patients, you have to see them very regularly. Now, during the initial fitting, you're going to see them very regularly, generally, after their first night, one week later, one month, two or three months, whatever. But generally on an ongoing basis, once this fit is stabilized, they should be seen every six months. And uh, you should be doing these particular procedures that are listed there. But uh, I do like to see every six months that axial length is done. Um, review at every visit, I always do, the wear schedule, uh, have them describe exactly what they're doing because certain of the process that you have described initially, they may have evolved on their own to do something different or heard something or couldn't find a solution. So again, re-up it every time review. And at the end of each six month visit, I set up the next visit for them. Once a year, we'll wanna do all of those same tests, but we will wanna measure their pressure 
internal evaluation and a cycloplegic evaluation. Now, the current uh, optical and, and pharmaceutical myopia management options really include ortho-K, the soft multifocals, and uh, the atropine and now, as well as the new spectacle options that are out there that are not quite available in the US. That's why I didn't put it on here yet. But there was a survey and review of uh, myopia management back in June of 19. So we're talking two years ago already. And they said that at that point, the responders said 62% were prescribing some form of myopia management. But interestingly enough, of those 67% said they included progressive lenses, which really have been shown to be minimally effective. And only 32% were prescribing ortho K and uh, other methods were there. But um, so they said that in this study and survey that uh, there was slightly increased rate of ortho K fitting because of the relationship of myopia management. Now, this was uh, about a year later, October, 2020 in uh, GPLI, they said, do you do myopia management? And it includes this now in this, Study, they said 29% were not doing myopia management, but of the other 71%, ortho K and soft multifocals had uh, taken over pretty much and atropine still a very strong one, but there were still a number still using these bifocal spectacles, which is really fascinating because the efficacy on those is shown to be very minimal. So one question that people always ask me uh, relative to this. And I think this comes from the atropine reactions that people have had talking about rebound. Um, there are two studies that were out there. One of them basically showed a minor rebound effect if patients stop before age 14. Um, there were other studies that showed that they returned after ortho K after discontinuing, they went back to whatever their previous rate of myopia progression was, but it was not faster. So here, I'm just going to inject my personal experience with this is that most patients who stop, if they ever stop, um, especially after they're 18 years old, will be within about half diopter of where their baseline was. Um, if they wait till after 18, I have uh, just personal experience that over a three-year period that it's a stable prescription during that three or four years afterwards. Uh, most of them are very stable, and there are a few patients who show slight progression after discontinuing. And the reasons for discontinuing most commonly is they couldn't wear them enough hours. College students, someone who got a job uh, where their hours were variable, working at night, they just couldn't keep regular wearing time to keep good vision during the day. Here's a part that I'd like to kind of demonstrate, and it shows how this really um, can work in practice. This is a common type situation. You have the eight-year-old girl who's wearing glasses and she comes in for her annual exam saying, I'm not, not seeing real good in the distance. She's got her one-year-old glasses that are 125 spheres. She's seeing 2050. You update her refraction. She's got a minus 225 in each eye. Her axial length is measured at 24.5. So there's options. How are you going to approach this patient from a myopia management standpoint? So first option you could say is we're just going to update her glasses. So you improve her vision. You're basically the advantage is it's easy for her, for the parents, generally very little cost, just the glasses, easy for the patient, easy for parents. But there's distinct disadvantages as we've seen that this patient is likely to continue progressing very quickly that while she's wearing her glasses, they could interfere with various activities, they could break, cause injury. And ultimately, many years down the road, she's a higher risk for myopic complications from these longer axial length. So basically, we're gonna skip ahead a little bit here. We're gonna see this patient now, all of a sudden, 10 years just went by, <laughs> okay? At age eight, these are the projections that might happen if she were to increase a half a diopter a year, she would be up to minus seven. If 
she increases axial length and an average of 0.3 millimeters per year. She, her axial length is now over 27 millimeters. She is at high risk for ocular pathology because of this high myopia and she has some activity restrictions. So these are all projections and maybe over, maybe underestimated. But the second option is here is you have another patient, identical, same prescription, same situation, but rather than prescribe the glasses for this patient, you say, let's, let's start ortho K for her. The benefits here, we're gonna slow that myopic progression. We're slowing the axial elongation she doesn't have activity restrictions. She's feeling good about herself, better than before. And she has a better overall vision-related quality of life. Disadvantages in going with ortho -K is she's got a little bit higher cost to start the process. She requires regular follow-up, very minor risk of complications, and a little more time spent on uh, lens care and maintenance. So here's the patient here, the same patient now, 10 years later, projected here. It's likely that she's going to be probably around a minus 375 rather than the two and a quarter that she started with at eight years old. And she's going to probably be increasing at a much slower rate, averaging about an eighth a diopter per year and about 0.05 millimeter axial length increase per year. So she's at 25. So this one even though she is myopic and has a risk of myopic pathologies, it's less, far less than the one who's 27 millimeters. And this patient has a better self-image. She doesn't have to wear glasses during the day. So again, how does this benefit the patient? We went over this a minute ago. I'm just gonna repeat this again, less visual disability, better options from surgery and less risk of axial length complications. Again, uh, this is something that I feel very strongly about is that which is a greater risk, prescribing ortho K or not prescribing some type of form of myopia management? Then the risks of ortho K is it just requires more office visits, a little risk of abrasions and complications and that they require more care. But if you don't manage that myopia, they're gonna to continue to be fast progressors. Uh, they're gonna have this increased risk of complications and be wearing glasses that are not real attractive. So present your case, discuss the pros and the cons of the various options of, and, and really don't forget about vision related quality of life. Talk about clarity of vision, quality of life, lifestyle, all these things, and, and again, how to correct their vision. They could be done with any of these options that are there, but I think ortho K has some real big advantages. And Mark went over this and I won't spend any time on that now, but talk about the projections for patients. But I think it's more important to present your own outcomes, not just the studies that are out there, but track the patients in your own practice. You can say, these are patients who wear glasses in my practice. This is what's happened to them over the past five years. Um, this is what's happened with ortho K patients or my soft lens patients, but track it yourself or use a registry and extract data from your EHR to generate reports about how your patients are responding. It's not just your patients, how you're treating them in your location, the ethnicity of the people. So it's, it's their neighbors that you're looking at, not just those from the study. Um, educate patients on the difference between correction of myopia and managing myopia progression. Don't scare them, but prescribe it and make your recommendation very confidently. Customize and individualize. You can combine atropine with ortho K, with soft lenses. There's a variety of different options you have, but I, I usually like ortho K for a variety of reasons for patients. And this is a, a quote that's attributed to Brian Holden. And I just think it, it's very appropriate at this point here. You know, we know a lot, there's a lot we don't know, but we know enough that we can't just sit by and, and not treat this. So why ortho K? No correction needed during waking hours, better vision related quality of life, 
the myopia management effect that you are creating with ortho -K is in play 100% of the time of their waking hours. And you can start these kids younger. So an overall summary, ortho -K is good at slowing axial elongation. Patients report great and improved vision related quality of life. It is safe and it has the unique advantages as a excellent myopia management intervention. And even if they're using other methods, glasses or atropine and soft lenses, they still need to wear something during the day. With ortho -K, no correction worn during the day. So I see Stephanie on the line here. Thank you very much for your attention.